It's now time for a question period. The member from Burlington. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Premier, the people of Ontario have lost confidence in your Liberal government Order. after you wasted after you wasted almost a billion dollars to save seats in Oakville and Mississauga in the 2011 election. Taxpayers are fed up with you wasting their money so the Liberals can cling to power. They want the Liberal Party of Ontario to pay it back. Will you support my private member's resolution tomorrow and commit to reimbursing yeah, yeah. taxpayers the $950 million that the Liberal Party wasted? And while the clock is stopped, I don't normally do this, but I'm blanket telling you that I will be tough today. And if you don't get the message, you'll get it quick. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And um, I, you know, I I, uh, I believe that the um, the question is in the context of all of the issues that have been raised uh, as a result of the relocation of the gas plants, Mr. Speaker. And those those questions have been raised repeatedly at the committee. We have sent tens of thousands of documents, to, uh, sheets of paper, and documents to the uh, committee, Mr. Speaker. We broadened the scope of the committee so all those questions could be asked. I think that there is a uh, much better understanding of uh, of what happened as a as a result or in the process of moving those gas plants, Mr. Speaker, something that we all in this House agreed needed to happen. I have said repeatedly that there were decisions made that uh, that shouldn't have been made. And, Mr. Speaker, what's really important is that as Answer. we go forward, we have in, in place a process that will ensure that this will not happen again. And that's what we're doing, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Saying sorry doesn't fix the problem because now we've moved on to Pan Am. But nevertheless, Premier, you signed the Cabinet document authorizing the plant cancellation and you served as co chair of the campaign that made the decision. When will you take responsibility for the money missing from the provincial treasury? This is the money that the Auditor General Minister said Rural Affairs didn't come to order. need to be spent. Saying sorry just is not enough. You need to pay back the money that you owe the taxpayers. You need to stop using taxpayers as a personal ATM. Will you reimburse the hundreds of millions of dollars that you owe the Ontario people? Yeah, yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. No, you asked the question. That's enough. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Conestoga, come to order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think a discussion of money lost to the provincial treasury would be a very interesting one, Mr. Speaker. So, if we look at uh, an asset like the 407, Mr. Speaker, I can remember. I can remember when I was campaigning in 2003, I met a former employee of the of MTO, Mr. Speaker, and uh, he said to me, you know, the $3 billion that was paid for that for the 407 was a fraction of what that asset was worth, Mr. Speaker. So there are billions of dollars at the outset that probably should have been paid, that that was a fire sale, Mr. Speaker. But ongoing, in an ongoing way, Mr. Speaker, I believe the revenue, and I'll, have to be, I'll stand to be correct by the Minister of Transportation, but I believe the revenue that could have gone into the provincial treasury is in the order of $700 million a year. That goes into a private company, Mr. Speaker, because of a fire sale that was, uh, that was made by the party officer, Mr. Speaker. That's Thank you. Final supplementary. You keep looking at the past because it doesn't want you to deal with the future. And I was just asked this question. Am I trying to bankrupt the Liberal Party? Well, you bankrupt Ontario taxpayers. Shameful. Shameful. It's your job as the government of Ontario to put the interests of the people of this province first. You failed to do that. Yep. We are calling on you to finally do the right thing. It's time the people of this province saw that the money would be returned. As the saying goes, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. <laughs> your government spent $950 million for... Uh, thank you. I know what I'm doing. I'm not liking the tone of that particular issue, and I would ask the member to withdraw, and I'm going to tell everybody I don't like that tone about uh, crime and criminality. Carry on and withdraw, please. Withdraw.
Now it's time for the government to take responsibility for its actions. Premier, will you acknowledge your mistake in taking that money from taxpayers and pay it back to the Treasury? Good question. Thank you very much. Stop the clock, please. Stop the clock, please. You see it, please? You see it, please? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as I have said, uh, we've had many, many opportunities to talk about uh, these issues at the committee, and that uh, that discussion is ongoing. But I think that, and the member for member from uh, Renfrew, come to order. Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke uh, says that people don't care about what happened 10 years ago. But I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, if the revenues that I spoke to on the the 407 were continuing to come into the provincial treasury, that would be billions of dollars that we would have as a government and as a, a legislature that we could spend on services. I, I guess the question to the member opposite would be, Will the party opposite find a way to pay back the billions on the 407, the hundreds of millions on the Eglinton subway, Mr. Speaker, the stranded hydro debt, Mr. Speaker? So I think that the member opposite understands that that is foregone revenue from the provincial treasury, and I would like to know what her leader would say about those debts, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Nepean Carlton. Premier and I uh, obviously want to congratulate her and Jane for, for their first grandchild. That's exciting. And I was third. Oh, sorry. Okay, grandson, first grandson. That's uh, fantastic. And hopefully he'll be wearing some Tory blue today. <laughs> uh, speaker, uh, I'd like to go back on this matter of the gas plants because it is clear that there is no confidence left in the government's handling of the energy file. In the last two weeks alone, the auditor confirmed. They blew $1.1 billion in cancelling gas plants. Then they cancelled $181 million worth of nuclear reactors. Then the OEB raised hydro rates. And then the 402 was shut down by angry Ontarians and rural communities who are opposed to this wind turbine development scheme. So if their energy policy wasn't in shambles two weeks ago, it certainly is now. There is zero credibility left. So Question. if you won't support my colleague from Burlington in her effort to get you to pay back that $950 million, will you be at least honest with the taxpayers of this Thank province you. when they open their energy bill? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I know the, uh, uh, the Minister of Energy will want to speak to this, but I, I want to just, just talk because this, this notion about the $180 million that has been spent on, uh, on getting ready for a, a new nuclear spend, Mr. Speaker, I just want to be clear about what that $180 million was for because I think people need to know that. So the Ontario Power Generation um, invested $180 million in environmental approvals, Mr. Speaker, in project planning, public and stakeholder consultations around a new potential, a potential new build. All of the OPG's expenditures related to the new uh, nuclear planning, they were reviewed by the Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker, which is an independent semi-judicial agency, as the uh, as the member opposite knows, and those those uh, expenses were posted publicly on their website. And much of what OPG is invested Answer. can be repurposed for the future if and when the province decides to move ahead. So, Mr. Speaker, that is lo not lost money. That is Thank money you. that is bought information. Thank you. Supplementary. I don't think that helps the, minute, the Premier escape the fact the last two weeks in the energy file have been absolutely disastrous Disaster. and has had a major impact on the ratepayers across this province. We know that she was in the middle of a series of very bad decisions, Speaker, with respect to the Oakville gas plants. And it doesn't matter how many panels that she creates for so-called quote-unquote open government. Everyone knows that she signed the cabinet document to cancel that power plant. Everyone knows that she was the campaign chair to make that decision. And now everyone knows, because of the Deputy Minister of Energy, that she knew well before she was quoting the 33 to $40 million cancellation fee, it would be upwards of $750 million or more. So if her party will not pay back the funds that they stole from the taxpayers in this province, the only thing that she can do now is actually tell Ontario taxpayers exactly how much it's costing Thank you. them. Mr. Speaker, we have been we have been asking now for several months for the Progressive Conservative Party to come forward with its costing when it campaigned so aggressively for the cancellation of both these plants. Now, Mr. Speaker, they have not been forthcoming, but Mayor Rob Burton of uh, Oakville put something on his website. I'd like to quote. You want to hear this? This yes. is a quote from his website. It's called the timeline. It's uh, on September 25, 2011. 
PC leader Tim Hudak says the Oakville power plant cancellation costs $1 billion and suggests the Mississauga power plant cancellation may cost another billion. On October 5, 2011, you want to hear this, on the day before the provincial election in front of the still under construction Mississauga power plant, PC leader Tim Answer. Hudak promises to stop the power plant if he wins the election after only days before warning that he's sure it may cost another billion. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. I'd like to go back to the Premier. It's really nice for the government house leader to try and get up and talk about something Nothing. that really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because I'll tell you something, Speaker. It was their government that cancelled the gas plant. It was their government that relocated to Napanee. And it was their government who cost taxpayers in this province $1.1 billion. Back to the Premier. It's clear that the government either doesn't know or doesn't care how much ratepayers are being charged for these disastrous scandals of the past two weeks. They are making policy decisions up by the fly. It is not in the best interest of our energy sector, nor is it in the best interest of the people who are paying for it across the province. If she can't tell us what that bill means and what the people of this province are paying when they open their hydro bill, when they open their natural gas bill across the province, she's not doing her job or she's incompetent. Question. Perhaps it's both. Will she actually ask the Auditor General to open up the books since she simply won't Thank you. do it? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, you know, the member can, can, can shout and scream and put on all the dramatics she wants, but she cannot deny the fact that it was the leader of her party who stood up and said that if he was elected Premier of this province, the Mississauga power plant, in his words, would be done, done, done. Mr. Speaker, we have heard for months and months this criticism from them that somehow the decision that we took, the same one they promised, has been the worst thing to befall civilization. Well, it's time they came clean, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, it's time they allowed their candidates to come before the committee and talk about their costing, talk about their analysis, and talk about why Tim Hudak, after admitting it would cost a billion dollars, went in front of uh, I do object. Sit down. The member is asked, as all members are, to use the title or to use the uh, writing. Please, the, uh, as a wrap up. Mr. Speaker, it's time they come clean why their leader stood after admitting it would cost a billion dollars in his estimate and explain Thank their you. costing and explain why they made the Thank exact you. same promise. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontario families are paying the highest electricity bills in Canada. They've seen this government spend over a billion dollars cancelling power plants and at least $180 million for a nuclear expansion scheme that the government now admits is too expensive to carry forward. Can the Premier tell us what contracts have been signed in regards to the refurbishment of the nuclear plant at Darlington? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I know that the Minister of Energy will want to speak to the supplementary, but I just want to, as I did uh, in a previous question, address the issue of the, uh, the, the information that has been gathered and the planning that was done uh, in, in anticipation of a new nuclear build. That money was spent on, on as I say, planning, on uh, public and stakeholder consultations, on environmental approvals. All of that work, Mr. Speaker, stands in, uh, in good stead for uh, usage in the future. So that is not money that has been wasted. That is money that was invested in information that can be used at a future date. So uh, I just wanted the leader of the third party to have that information. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'll help the Premier out. In documents that we've obtained, the Minister of Energy tells us that contracts worth $950 million have already been signed for Darlington. So, can the Premier then tell us what the final price tag will be for this project? Wow. Yeah. So, again, Mr. Speaker, and I know I said I would send the question to the uh, Minister of Energy. I'll send the next one to the Minister of Energy. But I, again, I just want to get at what it is the leader of the third party is saying. So, the new nuclear, there's a problem with that decision. She doesn't like the problem. She doesn't like the idea of us refurbishing. So uh, we know that the we know that the, uh, the the NDP doesn't support nuclear, doesn't support having a base load of nuclear, but they also don't support green energy, Mr. Speaker. It's really hard to identify what their energy plan is. We have said that we will refurbish our nuclear 
stock, Mr. Speaker. We said that having a base load of nuclear is very, very important for this province, that it will be part of our long-term energy plan. So it's really uh, a bit bemusing that the leader of the third party doesn't seem to have any strategy Answer. for a long-term energy plan, where we do actually have that plan, Mr. Speaker. Please. Please it, please. Please it, please. Final supplementary. Speaker, what new Democrats are concerned about is prudency in terms of knowing what we're paying for before we commit to spending the money. Right. Now, we got an answer to our question about the costs in a document from the Minister of Energy, and I'm going to quote from that document. A final timeline and cost will not be known until construction contracts are signed. So, can the Premier confirm that the government has no idea what the final price tag will be for this project, even though they've already signed contracts worth $950 million. Next question. Oh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Energy won't trust me because I'm not going to. I'll give him the next question. But, Mr. Speaker, I just I have to respond to the notion of prudence, and prudence is absolutely at the heart of having a plan for energy in this province, Mr. Speaker. And I don't know uh, if the leader of the third party is uh, is familiar with the way large capital projects work, Mr. Speaker, but the reality is that, yeah, you won't know the construction costs until a contract is signed, Mr. Speaker. There are many moving parts and unknowns, but what we have is a plan to have long-term stable energy supply in this province, and part of that is refurbishing our nuclear stock, Mr. Speaker. So it would be irresponsible of us not to have put in place the planning Answer. in order to get those contracts in place. It would be irresponsible of us not to look at how much uh, time we needed in order to refurbish that nuclear uh, capacity. We have a prudent plan Thank in place. You. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Premier Speaker, I would say that prudence is not only having a plan, but knowing how much you're going to put the taxpayers of this province on the hook for the cost of that plan. That's prudence, Speaker. Here's the facts. The government has signed contracts worth nearly a billion dollars to get started on a refurbishment of Darlington. But by their own admission, they have no idea what the final cost is going to be. Now, you wouldn't start making payments on a car without knowing what the final price tag is going to be, Speaker. And of course, this question is to the Premier. Does the Premier think that it makes sense to once again start making payments and signing contracts for a new electricity plan without having any idea what the final cost is going to be? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important that we know what's going on in this place this morning. You know, the, uh, the critic for the NDP uh, is quoted publicly, and he said it on several different occasions, he supports not building new nuclear, Mr. Speaker. Now, here's what's happening. We've had an outpouring from across the province, Mr. Speaker, of support for that decision. Many of them come from organizations and from people who would normally be supporting the NDP. So rather than state that they support the idea of not building new, they're trying to undermine the decision by attacking the previous cost, Mr. Speaker, and by talking about refurbishment. Now, I have a clear question for the leader of the third party. Does she support cancelling new nuclear construction? Thank you. Order, please. I don't get things quiet so other people can add their two cents worth. That includes the member from Cambridge who, if I ask him to go to his chair, then I could ask him to stop. Well, gee, Speaker, if the Liberals had listened to the New Democrats for the last 10 years, we wouldn't have wasted $180 million. very familiar to the people of Ontario, Speaker. Two years ago, the Premier was signing documents that ended up giving away the farm 
firm to private power companies costing Ontarians $1.1 billion. Now we find out that the government has signed off on another billion dollars in contracts to refurbish the Darlington, Darlington nuclear plant, but has no idea how high that price tag is going to be. Now, what does the Premier have to say to people who fear that she hasn't learned a thing from the gas plant fiasco, Speaker? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I take her answer to say yes, she supports not building new nuclear. She knew the costs that were out there. Why did she support cancelling new nuclear? She's done and saying exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Now she's upset that the people in her party, the organizations that she thinks are the exclusive possession of the NDP, are very, very vocal in supporting the initiative we've taken. Mr. Speaker, the OPG has been very responsible in how it's been dealing with the nuclear issue. The refurbishment, Mr. Speaker, will be 15,000 jobs. Does she want to kill those 15,000 jobs? They have spent money on contracts, Mr. Speaker. They have, they have done environmental assessment. They have been doing project work, Mr. Speaker. Answer. And that work now is there for us to use as a guide for the next 10 years when we make decisions on nuclear, Mr. Speaker. It's the right thing to do. We're Thank not you. going to spend money on power we don't need. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, Ontario families and businesses are paying the highest electricity bills in Canada, and they want their government to take steps to get costs under control. Instead, here's what they see. Over a billion dollars handed to private power companies to scrap the gas plants in Mississauga and Oakville, $180 million spent on a doomed plan for new nuclear plants, and now the government is signing almost a billion dollars worth of contracts. Member from Eglinton Lawrence, come to order. The final price tag will be. Now, what does the Premier have to say to businesses and households who are tired of paying for this government's electricity messes? Have the Liberals learned nothing? Thank you, Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, one thing we agree on, Mr. Speaker, Holding a paper in front of your face doesn't mean that I don't know it's you. But the problem is, the problem is you're having a conversation with people on this side while they're trying to answer, and even while the question was being put. So let's just stop, please. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, one thing we've done to mitigate price increases in the electricity system is to cancel $15 billion of energy construction, which we don't need because we have a surplus. You know what, Mr. Speaker? Member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, come to order. With new nuclear for $15 billion, then she is going to have to answer to the ratepayers for the increase. We are making decisions that are responsible no to ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. We have made responsible decisions moving forward, and I want to say that. Uh, Refurbishing the Candu reactors will allow Darlington to continue operating till approximately 2055. Answer. We are realizing on the investments we've already made, Mr. Speaker, and OPG is proceeding with definition work. They're proceeding with environmental assessments. That $180 million, dollars, Mr. Speaker, is an asset we can use. Thank you. To See the please new question. A member from Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. I'd like to ask the Premier a question about a $770 million contract that she signed off on as the Minister of Transportation in June of 2010. Wow. Speaker, that contract commits the government through Metrolinx to buy 182 LRT vehicles with very specific delivery dates. Well, the first delivery date has come and gone. And the reason that the government was not able to take delivery is that it has nowhere to put them. Given the Premier's new doctrine of transparency, I'd like to ask the Premier this. What are the penalties to date that the taxpayers have incurred as a result of that contract? And will the Premier agree to table that contract with us so that we can see the Question. details of that contract? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. There are a number of contracts out right across. The member from Renfrew will come to order now. That's the second time. 
Carry on. Mr. Speaker, there are a number of contracts right now, and I know that many people think of these as Toronto projects, but actually it is in the writing of Barry that all the tunneling equipment is being manufactured, it is in Thunder Bay, but that's it. Metrolinx has been doing an, a remarkable job delivering on 15 major uh, build-out projects, almost all of them. I think all of them significantly under budget uh, and on time, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have not I have not heard of any particular problems with those. I know there are management of these contracts, and the time Answer. are adjusted. They're highly scandalous, Mr. Speaker. When you're doing 15 major projects at the same time, I have a lot of confidence in Metrolinx to manage these contracts Thank in you. public interest, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier should have briefed her Minister of Transportation on this $770 million contract with Bombardier Transportation. Minister of the Environment, knows come to order. About it. The fact of the matter is that we have it on good authority that the penalties on that single contract today are more than $70 million and growing by the day. I'd like to ask the Premier this question. Will you, in light of your commitment to transparency, let your Minister of Transportation know what's in that contract? Will you table that contract with us here in the legislature? Will you agree not to download the cost of that contract onto municipalities who are being blackmailed into Question. taking those vehicles against their will? And will you commit that any municipal transit projects will be open to public tender from this point forward so that they don't have to enter your Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Transportation. Thank you very much, much Mr. Speaker. Do you know, it, it just, it just kind of galls me, Mr. Speaker, to hear from the party that downloaded billions of dollars on, of health and social services costs, forced amalgamation onto municipalities, standing in the House, are really being pretty petty and silly about this, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we work in a very challenging environment on what is, quite frankly, a $50 billion transit build-out. There are changes that are made, some requested by members opposite, and they're complex. We, we, will we, are, we are in the middle of negotiations right now, uh, Mr. Speaker, through Metrolinx, with the, with the TTC and with the city to accommodate requests they've made. That will mean the cancellation of storage facilities, the reassignment of cars, and additional costs, Mr. Speaker. If you don't want to be a high-handed government and you actually want to work with municipalities, there will Answer. be costs and changes to meet those, Mr. Speaker. We have respected municipal government, and the party opposite, Mr. Speaker, could take a few lessons from us on that. Thank you. Question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. According to the Auditor General of Ontario, the Cabinet decision signed by the Premier quote, clearly favoured TransCanada and gave it the upper hand in the negotiations for a project to replace the Oakville plant. Last week, New Democrats said publicly we're calling for the Premier to attend the Justice Committee and explain why she set the meal, wheels in motion to pay TransCanada more to cancel the plan than the original cost. The Premier is on notice in the press here in the legislature and with correspondence from the clerks. Will the Premier come to the Justice Committee to explain why she signed on to a plan that the auditors, auditor said, quote, favors TCE and waive protections the OPA had under the Oakville contract. Wow. Thank, you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the government House Leader will want to comment on the broader issues, but I have actually not received uh, an invitation from the committee, as far as I know, Mr. Speaker. And as I have said uh, in this House, I have been to the committee. I have answered all the questions that were asked of me, Mr. Speaker. I have given all the information that I have uh, on this matter, Mr. Speaker. And uh, again, uh, I, if the member has a specific question, I'd be happy to answer it here in the House. But as I say, I've, I've acted responsibly. I've been uh, responsibly. I've been to the committee. What I really think would be terrific right now, Mr. Speaker, is if all the information that has been gleaned by the committee could come together in a report, and we could get some advice from that committee on what we need to go, do going forward. Because we're putting a plan in place, but it would be great to have the uh, committee's perspective on that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. The Premier has claimed that she wants to be more open. 
Since the Premier's last appearance, the Auditor General put the true waste at the gas plants at $1.1 billion. And the Auditor specifically highlighted decisions signed off by the Premier. Will the Premier respond in committee to those issues? Will the Premier come to the Justice Committee and explain why she was signing a document that helped put money into the pockets of private companies and took it out of the pockets of Ontarians, or will she keep hiding from the committee? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, it was this Premier that asked the Auditor General to look into the Oakville situation. It was this Premier who worked, who asked me as House Leader to work with the opposition to establish a committee process which has full access to uh, witnesses, to documents to move forward. But you know, Mr. Speaker, it's a little strange that this member has changed his tune about this particular document because on April 11th, he had this to say about the cabinet directive that he just asked about, and I quote, I don't see it as a smoking gun. We knew that cabinet was approving this process, so this does not surprise me. The simple fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is the Premier has appeared in front of the committee. She answered dozens and dozens of questions. She has been forthcoming with documents. Members of her staff, members of her cabinet, Mr. Speaker, I had a very enjoyable hour and a half in front of the committee asking, answering questions about documents I had never seen in meetings. I had never attended. We have been as forthcoming as possible. Thank it's you. time for the committee to wrap up Thank its you. work and issue a report. New question, the member from Ottawa South. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister, over the summer and through the fall, I've had the opportunity uh, to meet with many residents and families of Ottawa South and listen to their interest and their concerns. All of us here know that the most important part of what we do is to connect people to government and to the services that they and their families need. I've met with a number of families and groups who are wondering what the future may hold for those with a developmental disability, whether it be for a friend or a family member. Speaker, after listening to their concerns, I fully understand and share them. I know that there are limited resources available, and I also know that this government has consistently expressed a commitment to help. Could the minister tell us what actions the government is taking this year to help individuals with a developmental disability? And their families. Thank you, Great Minister question. of Community and Social Services. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm first going to ask for some mercy because I'm losing my voice. So, um, but I want to thank the member for his uh, question. Our government's commitment to this sector is strong and continues to be strong. In fact, this year uh, we're investing over 1.7 billion dollars in the developmental services sector. And I think it's important to point out that 98 percent of that funding goes directly for services to individuals. Um, this year, uh, the additional $42.5 million uh, in, in the budget will help more than 1,100 adults and their families, and uh, that's good. Speaker, since we came to office in 2003, funding for this sector has increased by 62 percent. And uh, I know that uh, the demand for developmental yes, services sir. continues to grow. That's why we all in this place need to work tirelessly to understand uh, the needs and to respond thank to you. them. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for that answer. It's encouraging to hear about these investments uh, the government has been making uh, to support families in need. I know that there are more people in urgent need of care, and it's good to learn that more families will be receiving the care that they need with these steps. Mr. Speaker, as encouraging as that, as that is, we all know that the, need that, that the need is great and that there's more to do. Mr. Speaker, I would ask the minister if he can elaborate on what this government's vision is for those with a developmental disability. Thank you, Minister. Well, speaker, I'd be delighted to do that, and I appreciate again the question because it highlights the concern that I think all members of this House have for, uh, for people uh, in this sector. And I believe we have a common goal, all of us here, to make sure that we respond as best we can. Uh, we all want to see people with developmental disabilities, Speaker, receiving appropriate supports and taking part in their communities as full uh, and equitable members. Um, but there's a lot more to do. Let's not uh, kid ourselves about it. That's why I was so pleased to support the uh, resolution that came from the honourable member opposite to s create a select committee. I understand. Uh, I understand that uh, that committee will actually select committee will actually be meeting today, and we pledge uh, on the side of the house to do everything we we can to assist them in their work. Thank you. Thank you. New question. 
New question, the member from ooh, Tobacco Lakes are just in time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Uh, Premier, yesterday we discussed the fact that you had 36 uh, consultation groups uh, since since you've uh, taken over nine nine months ago. Well, um, in the course of that, I had some some questions from people about why are Conservatives involved in some of these groups, and of course the obvious answer to that is that they they give credibility to it. <laughs> but, In thinking about the matter, though, we've really c concluded that you have 37 groups. And, of course, the 37th group is the most important group of all, the one that you consult with every day, the one that's making the real decisions around here, our colleagues here to the left. <laughs> my question, Mr. Speaker, my question is, when are you going to formalize this arrangement and let the people of Ontario know who's really running this place? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, as, as the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing says, it's sort of hard to know where to start in answering that question. But, Mr. Speaker, I think I'll start here, and that is that. Uh, as I said yesterday, we are a government who believes that it is better to talk to people who know, who have expertise, who are able to give us advice on uh, a range of subjects, Mr. Speaker. I really believe that that is how good decisions are made. And I will just, uh, I will just paint a picture. And again, it goes back to a time that I know the member opposite remembers when it was impossible to get a meeting with a minister, Mr. Speaker. I remember during the uh, the discussions around amalgamation, I tried to have a meeting with the, uh, the minister of the time, Al Leach, and his doors were locked, his people wouldn't answer our calls. We couldn't get a meeting with him, Mr. Speaker, to talk about amalgamation. I remember answer. being a school trustee, Mr. Speaker, not being able to get a meeting to talk about amalgamation of school boards. Thank that's you. not how we operate. That's how they operate, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Supplementary. Supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is again is to the Premier. It's very easy to try to offset blame by blaming somebody else and bringing up examples of things that you think happened many, many years ago. But the fact is, right in this very House this morning, we had the perfect example of open and transparent. MPP Cleese asked you and your minister for some information on a contract, and he got a bunch of gobbledygook and no answer whatsoever. Now, what in the world is going on? The residents of Ontario are entitled to an answer. We're entitled to an answer. When are you going to become open and transparent? Thank you. Premier. Much, Mr. Speaker. Well, and I, you know, I'm not going to say it's a good question, but I am. I'm glad that the member opposite has asked this question, Mr. Speaker, because obviously, if there is a question about a specific issue and we don't have the specific information about that contract, we will get we will get that information for the member opposite, Mr. Speaker. That is how. It works. And I know that the member opposite hasn't been a minister of the Crown, but the, the member for Aurora. Aurora, Newmarket Aurora, has been a minister, and he knows perfectly well that when there are specific questions about a contract or a situation, the minister can go back and get that information from officials, which we will do, Mr. Speaker. But fundamentally, I was not blaming anyone. What I was saying was there is a contrast in the way we do business with the way they do business. There always has been, and listening to people and taking advice and making decisions in that way is Order. New question. Member from Timmins James Bay. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, what's clear is uh, Senator Mike Duffy and Pamela Wallen and others are really making the case that we should be getting rid of the federal Senate. Your, oh, I, I like that. Your, your former leader, Mr. De, Mr. Uh, McGinty, was pretty clear enough abolishing the Senate. Why don't you take the same position? How can you now say, in light of everything that's going on with the federal Senate, that you think that this institution could be reformed rather than scrapped? Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, <laughs> we are uh, we are not the federal government. If the member opposite hadn't noticed, this is not a decision that we can make. Uh, we can make on our own. My my job as premier is to unite people, not to divide them, Mr. Speaker. And the changes that are being advanced by the federal government fundamentally alter the uh, the nature of the summits of the Senate, Mr. Speaker. So I have taken the position that I think that there is the possibility of reform. That is my personal position, Mr. Speaker. And you know, it is it is a discussion that has to happen across the country, and it has to be led by the Prime Minister as he said he would, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, what's clear is that people in this, in this country and people in this province are united in trying to get rid of the Senate. What we've now got is we have Senator Duffy and others who are demonstrating, quite frankly, that that institution as long should be gone. We as a province have a role to make because amending the Constitution, which it will take to get rid of the Senate, takes provincial, uh, takes provincial approval. So I say again, as a leader of the government, are you prepared to take the position that, in fact, Ontario should adopt the position of abolishing the Senate in this country? Mr. Speaker, the, the member opposite may want to suggest that this is a burning issue on the minds of every single person in this province, but I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, as the chair of the Council of the Federation, when this, when this issue was raised in the summer by one of the premiers, one of my colleague premiers, one premier raised it. It was such a non-issue in terms of constituency around the table. No one else even wanted to comment on it, Mr. Speaker. There was no discussion. There was a consensus that this was something that the federal government needed to lead, that Prime Minister Harper had said he wanted to put on the table and he was going to lead the discussion. That's where the discussion has to take place, Mr. Speaker, and I believe that that is rightly there, and I would hope that the, uh, the member opposite is in active conversation with Thomas Mulcair and let them have that discussion at the federal level, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, I've got a question today for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Uh, Minister, our government's economic plan to drive jobs and growth has three pillars. We're investing in people, we're investing in infrastructure, and we're supporting a dynamic and innovative business climate in Ontario. Now, I know in, in my riding of Thunder Bay, Atacokan, I've got great examples of what we've done on the infrastructure front, bringing forward projects that have been sought after for decades, actually, uh, that we are now delivering on that have created tremendous infrastructure improvements and are also creating a, a lot of work. And so that's a wonderful piece on the business climate piece through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund and through a long list of significant tax reforms. We've gone a long way to support businesses in Ontario as well. Speakers, the minister has reminded us many times in this House, Ontario is the leading jurisdiction for exploration and production of minerals in Canada and remains to this day a major player across the world. There's no question that question. mining and exploration industry is an important contributor to our provincial economy. Will the minister please inform the legislature how our government's economic plan to drive jobs and growth is working hand in hand thank to you, grow the minister Ontario's of mining industry? Development and mines. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the member for Thunder Bay Atacoke, and he put it so well. I mean, yesterday is a great example of that. I have the great pleasure of being at the Lac des Hill mine site north of Thunder Bay at the commissioning of a new mine shop, the North American Palladium, our great platinum palladium mine. Very impressive project, $400 million investment by North American Palladium, sustaining 500 jobs, just a great example of how our mineral exploration strategy is working. I mean, our government speaker has invested over $140 million in Ontario's mineral sector activity to date, and the success is there to be seen. I mean, the real good example, over the last 10 years since we, we, we became the government, 23 new mines have opened in the province of Ontario, more than anywhere else in Canada. Speaker, we are confident that by providing the right climate to attract investment in mining, we're going to be support continue to support Answer. job creation and activity, economic activity that will help to continue to grow Ontario's economy. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, thank you, Speaker and Minister. Obviously, 23 new mines opening over the course of 10 years speaks very clearly to the support and the climate that we've helped to create here in Ontario. Now, one of the projects that's on the minds of many Ontarians, especially those in Northern Ontario, is the Ring of Fire. And I must say, I'm always amazed and remark find it remarkable the criticism that comes forward that we expect as a government, but the incredible simplicity of the, cri of the criticism. Many of the members who will criticize us, uh, us on this project uh, will not speak about the First Nations involvement. They won't talk about the federal government's role. 
They will criticize us as the provincial government. They don't talk about the individual municipalities or the federations of municipalities that have their own perspectives on these issues. They don't talk about infrastructure, and of course, they don't talk about the multiple Question. mining companies who all have a role in this. Minister, please share with the members of the legislature how our government's working hard to ensure the development of this project, including considerations such as investments in communities and infrastructure. Thank you. Well it really is a great question. Thanks so very much uh, to the member of Thunder Bay out of The truth is, he's given a great example of just how complex it is to realize the economic potential of this extraordinary opportunity. I mean, we, we know a number of things. We know that in order for community to take advantage of this tremendous opportunity, they need to be ready, and that's the kind of work that's underway in our ministry. Mentioned the work we're doing with the Matawa First Nations on a historic framework uh, agreement and community readiness strategies for communities such as Thunder Bay and Green Stone, which will ultimately be the transportation hub for the Ring of Fire. I mean, I want to encourage all members to speak to us about the work that we're doing, because indeed that's going forward in a positive way. We're having discussions with all interested companies, Speaker. Those discussions obviously include important infrastructure links. We recognize how important infrastructure is. You've got to be able to have, obviously, access to the Answer. product. You've got to have access. So it's key. Let me tell you this. We are assessing uh, a number of options that will see the greatest benefit for Ontarians. We're looking at those. Thank you. It's the most beneficial and appropriate role Thank you. for the pro. New question. The member from Sonia Lampert. Speaker, my uh, question is to the Premier. Premier, uh, your Liberal government has refused to recognize the opportunity that the development of Alberta's oil and gas sector would mean to the economy of Ontario. Alberta will require an estimated $120 billion in goods and services over the next 20 years. On Friday, it's my understanding, you'll be in Calgary to discuss economic issues and energy with the Alberta government. Will you commit today to this House to creating those conditions of economic growth and, and job creation in Ontario by pledging your unwavering support and your government for the Alberta oil and gas sector and those thousands of well-paying jobs and then billions of investment that were created in Ontario. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the, uh, the question because I am very pleased that I'm going to be able to uh, meet over the next couple of days with both Premier Selinger and Premier Redford. And uh, you are absolutely right that uh, oil and gas and the, uh, the importance of our relationship with Alberta is going to be at the core and at the heart of my conversation with Premier Redford. And I have said, I have said publicly many times that I understand the interconnections and I understand how important it is that we, that we strengthen that relationship. On the, on the issues around uh, oil and gas and the transportation of uh, fuel, Mr. Speaker, I again have been very clear that uh, I understand how important it is that we're able to move that, those goods across the country and that at the same time ensuring that the environmental protections are in place mr speaker and making sure that the relationships with first nations people are in place as we do that are of fundamental concern to me and, and uh, i have said that publicly and i will be in re i will be reinforcing that with the premier of alberta thank you supplementary well, speaker back to the premier Premier, experts agree that the greatest beneficiary of developing the oil and gas and resource sector in Alberta and, and the West, outside of that Royal Rose country, is the province of Ontario and our highly skilled workforce in this province. Despite the fact that your predecessor, Premier McGuinty, was steadfastly opposed to Ontario benefiting from the Alberta oil sands development. Premier, will you stand in your place today and admit that the former Premier was wrong and instead outline what you will do to make sure Ontario benefits from the Alberta resource and makes it an Ontario advantage. Here, here, here. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, my predecessor took a leadership role in bringing here, here. people together across this country and working with premiers across the country, and particularly with Premier Redford, as a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker. So it is very important to me as the this year the chair of the Council of the Federation and as the Premier of Ontario that we understand that this country will work better if we work together. And the uh, the leadership that the Minister of Finance has taken on a single securities regulator, Mr. Speaker, is extremely important to the well-being of the country. The leadership, Mr. Speaker, that I want to take on advancing the cause of enhancing the uh, CPP, Mr. Speaker, so that people in this country can have a retirement, can look forward to a decent and, and dignified retirement, Mr. Speaker, that is something that is very important to me, and I will be working with my colleague premiers to raise that issue, yes, and I hope, Mr. Speaker, to engage the federal minister of finance on that. That's the kind of leadership that we want to see it, please.
be seated, please. New question, Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, two little girls in Sudbury shaved their heads, and they did it to honour the memory of Sam Bruno, a close member of their family, and to raise money for the cause that he championed until the very day he died, bringing a PET scanner to Sudbury. Northwestern Ontario has had a PET scanner, and Southwestern Ontario has several PET scanners. This is about equity, Speaker. If a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old get it, why can't this government understand that patients in northeastern Ontario deserve a PET scanner? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, I first want to say to the two 10-year-old girls uh, who care so passionately about health care that they would shave their heads, thank you for caring so much about health care, Speaker. I think it's very important to, uh, to acknowledge that people in uh, northeastern Ontario do have access to pet services, Speaker. All people in Ontario have access to pet scans uh, when they need them. Uh, Speaker, every uh, Lynn, every hospital makes decisions about how they spend resources. Uh, the issue of whether or not a PET scanner is required in northeastern Ontario is a decision that uh, uh, is of the, that Lynn and of the hospital. Speaker, so what's important to me is that people get access to the care, and we know, Speaker, that in northeastern Ontario, this is a, a, a request. I know the member from Nickel Belt has talked about this. But, Speaker, we must be very um, uh, careful about Thank how you. we spend the health care dollars. Thank you. Well, Speaker, perhaps the Minister of Health needs to be reminded that the Lynn and all of the hospitals have actually requested the PET scanner be brought to this part of the province. PET scanners can help very sick patients, Speaker. They give doctors a special set of eyes that can help determine a course of treatment. Anyone who has supported a loved one suffering from cancer knows that getting them out of bed and into a car is hard enough never mind transporting them hundreds of kilometers away for a test. Now, there's no doubt that PET scanners are expensive, Speaker, but the community is doing its part to offset the costs. In fact, they're holding another fundraiser tomorrow night. Now, if this government can blow more than a billion dollars of public money on moving gas plants around in southern Ontario, why can't it spare some change, Speaker, to bring a PET scanner to Sudbury? Thank you. Mr. Uh, well, Speaker, it's, it's disappointing, frankly, to hear the, the leader of the third party talk about the cost of uh, operating a PET scanner as, as loose change, Speaker, because PET scanners are very expensive machines. Operating them is a very costly uh, undertaking, so it's important that we're smart about where we locate PET scanners. And I take issue, Speaker, and to the best of my knowledge, neither the Lynn nor the hospital agrees that a PET scanner is the priority investment right now. Uh, speaker, I have not had an, up -to -date, uh, an update on that in the last uh, few months. Uh, if that has changed, I will happily correct my record. But my understanding is that that is not a priority for the hospital or for the Lynn at this time. Thank you. Question, the member from Ottawa, Orleans. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Speaker, protecting the health and environment of Ontarians has been a priority for me as long as I have been a member of this legislature. So I was proud when our government committed in 2003 to eliminating the use of coal fire generation in the province. Eliminating the use of dirty coal is providing numerous and significant benefits to the people of Ontario. For one, it's going to mean cleaner air for people in all parts of the province and less Ontarians suffering from air pollution related diseases. Mr. Speaker, I understand that this morning the Minister of Energy announced an update on the progress of our government's initiative to get off coal. Could you please share with the House the progress that we have made on this important initiative, Mr. Minister? Thank you, Minister of Energy. Speaker, I thank the member from uh, Ottawa Orleans for his uh, question. And, Speaker, it was my pleasure to announce this morning that the Lambton Generating Station has burned its last coal. This, this leaves Manitou Generating Station slated to close at the end of this year. Now I'm going to have to talk more quickly. <laughs> this leaves Nanako Generating Station slated to close at the end of this year as the last operating coal-fired facility in southern Ontario. Ontario is now on track to become the first jurisdiction in North America to totally eliminate coal-fired generation. Wow. Getting off coal is going to save our health care system $4.4 billion in avoided health care costs. 
and it's going to lower Ontario's carbon emissions by over 30 megatons. Exactly. That megatons. Mr. Speaker, that's like taking yes, 7 sir. million cars off the road. Seven million. Today, we have Canada's most modern electricity system, its most advanced smart grid, and a diverse and reliable supply of clean and renewable energy. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, thank you to the Minister of the, uh, for the update. I believe that this makes Ontario a global leader in clean energy initiatives. Along with improving the health of Ontarians and reducing health care costs, by reducing illnesses from pollution, I understand getting off coal also represents one of the largest climate change initiatives in all of North America. And as the minister mentioned, it means massive reduction in the climate change causing emissions that our uh, province produces. This is especially important as the carbon content of our atmosphere moves beyond the 400 parts per million this year. All this adds up to a substantial improvement in both the health and the environment for the province. Mr. Speaker, I believe that Ontario's efforts to get off coal have made it a global leader in clean energy. Can the minister please tell the House how this initiative compares with the efforts of other jurisdictions to decrease their dependence on dirty coal? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, getting off coal is the single largest climate change initiative in North America. And don't just take it from me, Mr. Speaker. Listen to what the Federal Minister of Foreign Affairs, John Baird, said earlier this year. Oh, John! I'm quoting. We're the only country in the world that's committed to getting out of the dirty coal electricity generation business. If the federal conservatives can support our efforts to stop burning coal, Mr. Speaker, why can't their counterparts at Queen's Park understand the importance of this initiative? Maybe it's because when the PC party was last in office, the use of dirty coal grew by 127 per cent. Our efforts to get off dirty coal are making Ontario a healthier place to live. And we think it's time the opposition joined their federal colleagues and supported a cleaner, Thank healthier you. Ontario. Join with Prime Minister Harper. New question, the member from Halliburton, Portland, Lake, Block. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. Uh, more than 20 years ago, a group of peaceful, respectful people known as the Buddhist Association of Canada's Sham Shan Temple toured the township of Cavan Monaghan in the area of what would now become the city of Kawartha Lakes. They purchased land for its beautiful scenery and peacefulness. Their $40 million plan was to build a picturesque retreat that would include replicas of the four great Buddhist mountain sites of China. It would include a restaurant, gift shop, and accommodations. This peaceful operation has the potential to bring in millions of dollars in tourism revenue for the area, but the proposed wind farms call for at least four industrial wind turbines to be built right beside them and would ruin the tranquil scenery and harm the peacefulness of this retreat. So, Premier. Will the Buddhist dream be gone with the wind? Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I appreciate uh, the question from the member. Uh, I have not personally, or I don't believe my office has heard from this particular group, and I certainly would uh, be uh, welcome to, uh, uh, to invite them into my office, Mr. Speaker, and have a conversation the with them. Huron but I have to say, to Mr. Order. Speaker, that we have taken some very, very significant decisions in how to properly site our energy infrastructure. But the issue is, Mr. Speaker, and I put this to the member very, very clearly, there's an existing wind contract, and I'm asking her whether or not her leader supports cancelling existing wind contracts. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Minister, because they have asked to have a meeting with you and have not had any acknowledgement of that, so I'll be taking that back to you. But it is alarming to me that the Liberal government will go to any length for their own self-interest, even if it means ruining a legitimate project on land purchased more than 20 years ago. The government wants to allow its own interests to prevent millions of dollars being spent in a region that has high unemployment and in desperate need of jobs. The Buddhist Association of Canada is a peaceful group of people who want to run something that will be spiritually, economically, and visually pleasing for people. Minister Chan has visited the site and is in support. So the local councils of Port the Lakes and Cabin Monaghan, they've done their part by voting down proposed wind turbines. I ask the Premier again if Question. she will put an end to this issue and stop forcing wind turbines on our
That door is ready to be used by somebody. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I heard a lot of shouting coming from the uh, minister, from uh, from the uh, member from uh, North Bay. He was one of the biggest supporters of wind, uh, Mr. Speaker. We have all kinds of quotes. Uh, his municipality did it. Mr. Speaker, what's really important here is that we have existing wind contracts, and the issue is how do we deal with existing wind contracts? And I have asked the leader of the opposition to clarify his position and clarify it for the purpose of the member. Will he cancel existing contracts for wind? Yes or no? He has said yes, then he has said no, then he said yes. He's all over the map. He has no policy in any way, shape. And you're supposed to stop when I stand. New question. The member from Mississippi Cochrane. Thank you. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. More than 78,000 young Ontarians have participated in the Ranger program since 1944. The unique part of this program is it placed 17 year olds to work in parts of our great province far from their homes. The program built awareness, job skills, and an overall appreciation of the diversity of our great province in yesterday's and today's leaders, but sadly, not tomorrow's, because the Liberal government cut the program. Today, we'll present a petition with over 6,000 signatures to save the program. Will the government listen and commit to reinstating the full Ranger program and give young people a chance of a lifetime? Thank, thank you, Speaker. And I uh, certainly appreciate the question from the member opposite on this uh, very important issue. I'm very pleased that in our ministry, we continue to be the top employer of young people in the government, 1,974 jobs through the Ministry of Natural Resources. Here, here. That continues to remain the same despite the financial challenges that we have as a government, which I think speaks to the Premier's commitment and our government's commitment to helping to support opportunities for young people in the province of Ontario. In fact, with the change of the Youth Ranger program to a day-based program, we've added 17 additional locations across the province of Ontario. We've gone from 13 locations in Ontario to 30 locations in Ontario. In fact, there are three in the members' riding opposite, which provide fantastic opportunities for young people in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. From Abdomen, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister. Uh, speaker, in my youth, I was fortunate to have participated in the Ranger program for two years. I learned and accomplished real tasks that, to a great extent, have shaped and made me who I am today. But now the MNR budget is being cut, parks are being closed, and the young people are not getting the opportunity to explore and learn. Will this government commit to reinstating the Ranger program and not deny our youth this invaluable experience? Yeah. Speaker, you know, I appreciate hearing that from the member opposite. And the member opposite is well aware that there are about 74,000 alumni of the program throughout the province who are very active and, and certainly appreciate the experiences that they've been able to gain. And that is why, despite the incredible financial pressure that we're facing in our ministry and across the government, we have maintained this program in a way that continues to bring these opportunities to young people right across Ontario. In fact, we've enhanced the locations in the province by uh, adding 17 more locations in Ontario that will allow young people to gain these opportunities, uh, and we're committed to ensuring that this program is one that continues uh, in the future, Speaker. Thank yeah, yeah. you. Point of order for the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to welcome my good friend Linda McQuaig from the from the riding of Toronto Centre to Queen's Park today. The uh, member from Nipissing. Point of order, Point Speaker. Of order. I'm not sure whether to challenge the. Uh, the uh, energy minister for his uh, comment, oh, but I will make a point of order on the comment made by the environment minister. He talked about the privacy commissioner. Uh, the privacy commissioner ruled. I found the. I, uh, I remind all members that uh, I. Uh, I, uh, I'm waiting for 
attention, please. Thank you. That's not a point of order. Member from Scarborough Good Guildwood. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome to the House today my brother Andrew Hunter. He spent the last 10 years uh, playing international basketball over 40 countries, has recently graduated with his MBA, and will be starting his business career in St. Thomas, Ontario. Yeah. The member from Northumberland could be west on point of order. Point of order, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I would like to also welcome Chief Marston from uh, Alderville First Nations to uh, uh, Queen's Park here this afternoon. Thank you very much. There are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. this afternoon.